Amen. We have any other? Any questions or comments here from anybody here present? Yeah, I have a question. Um, <laughs> I was trying to formulate this question for a long time. Let me see how it's crazy. Um, I know that it was a certain man that came to Jesus and, and he asked Jesus to perform a miracle for him. But Jesus said, do you believe? And um, the man said, yes, he, he believes he has faith. But could you uh, help him with his unbelief? And this was um, when you were stating the fact that uh, unbelief, unbelief about God's word. And uh, I know that the devil comes to plant seeds of disbelief. Mm -hmm. And my question was, will it or is it at any time okay to have disbelief? Saying that, uh, yes, God help me with my disbelief, but I do have faith. Say, for instance, someone is in this... Uh, Physicians say they need to be healed. They have just, God forbid, but just say cancer. Mm -hmm. But they're in a place where they're like, God, please heal me. But the devil is still throwing seeds of doubt, saying that, hey, God, you, why, why are you doing this? You're not going to be healed or this mm -hmm. or that. But at the same time that you're going to the altar, of, you know, God, I know that you have all power to heal me. And, you know, I, I rebuke the devil constantly. But these are still seeds of doubt that's being planted into your mind. Mm -hmm. It's at any time. Is that a place where you can say there is room for doubt? If there's room for what? A doubt. Because, I mean, I know the devil do play seeds of doubt. Because even though you do have faith, you still are uh, human. And the devil uses uh, certain things to try to cast doubt within your life. All right, let's 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 answer that with the word. Let's go to the first chapter of the book of James. First chapter of the book of James. And uh, we're going to start reading at verse 2. Amen. All right. James, now, we always try to point this out. This James was not one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. He was not the younger brother of John. This James was one of the Lord's brothers. Was one of those ones that were standing there at that door uh, with, with their mother, desiring to see him. He was also one of those that was telling the Lord to go on up to Jerusalem. If you claim to be this great, great miracle worker, go do him over there. You see, the Bible says that none of his brothers believed on him until he ascended, until he was raised again, you see. And so this, is, this James is not the younger brother of John. He was one of the Lord's brothers. All right. Let's go ahead and we're going to start reading in verse 2 to answer this question. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, I want you to notice... What that says there, that we are to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. In other words, trials. That don't mean temptations as far as sin. That's, that word is better translated as trials. Going through rough times or whatever the case may be. It says to count it all joy. And then he tells us in verse 3 why. He says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith Amen. worketh patience. In other words, you don't know... How much faith you got until you're going through something where you need it? Amen. Now, the Lord allows us to go through these trials to show us. It's just like a test. You don't know how much history you know until you take a history test. Amen. And then when you take that history test, you might say, well, I did okay. Or I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. Why? Because if you're not taking a history test, you can think that you're the history major. So if, you're not, if you don't have trials in your life, you might think you king faith. I got all the faith, God. You see, uh, you don't know how much faith you got until some trials, the devil sends some trials your way. And then you have to believe God, you see. All right, let's keep reading verse 4. I mean, verse, the last part of that verse it says that, that trying of our faith, it works patience. Verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, lacking nothing. And so what is it saying? That through our trials, 
our patience is tried and what it does is it produces our, I mean, our faith is tried and what it does is it produces patience. Let me tell you, explain, let me give you a scenario of what that's talking about. You got somebody uh, that may uh, have, uh, maybe about to put out of their house, you know, have their house foreclosed on. And so what goes on when, when that happens or uh, when bills need to be paid and somebody is sending you a shut off notice for your bill, you know, for electricity or gas or whatever the case is, you're walking around trying to figure out how you're going to take care of it yourself, which is the opposite of patience and faith. In other words, I, I, I'm in a hurry. I, you know, the electricity is going to be cut off tomorrow, so I have to figure out something. I have to do something. You, now you're not operating in, in faith, and when you, when you stop operating in faith, you become impatient. Amen. Why? Because I, I'm not waiting on God anymore. I got to handle it myself. Amen. You see how that, how that goes together now? All right, verse Five, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask how? Faith. In faith, nothing wavering. In other words, God, I'm believing for you today. Oh, tomorrow, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Where you at? Mm -hmm. That's wavering. The not, we can't stop the devil for, from trying to send doubt. He's going to do that. He's going to try to bring doubt. But listen, you don't have to believe the devil's report. Amen. You see, the devil will have you looking at your watch, waiting on God. Yeah. <clears throat> when you're doing that, you're not, you're not walking in faith and you're not walking in patience. You're not operating in patience. You, you just, you know, you're giving God a certain timeline and he has to be that, do that, or you're going to take it on yourself. Let me tell you something. There have been plenty of times uh, I've prayed for something and the Lord have convicted me about it because I pray about it. Like for it, it, just a headache. I just say even for headaches. I just make it just simple like that. I pray, Lord, I, you know, I know that you're a big God and you got all kind of cancer that you need to heal. But I don't want this headache either. <laughs> and so I pray, Lord, heal this headache. And I'm going to tell you what the devil will do. Well, you, you got some Tylenol up, upstairs. Go, go, go take some of that. And the Lord will come right back with, didn't you pray and ask me to heal you? You see how to see? So that we can waver in little things like that. We pray and ask God to do something. And, and then God don't move fast enough. So now we're going to help him out. We're going to mix faith with medicine. <laughs> the Lord will operate through this. You see how folks make that excuse? No, the Lord don't need medicine's help to heal you. We'll just make that plain, you see. He don't need a doctor's help to heal you, you see. He can do it on his own. And so the Bible tells us that we're not to waver. All right, let's keep reading here. It says, verse, uh, verse 6, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now, what does that mean? We know that in... in, in uh, Peter's day that that wind was was had came when he began to walk on water. And so what did he do? He began to waver. Now, the word of God had already spoke. He, he said, Lord, if it's you, then bid me to come to you. And the Lord answered, that, OK, yes, yeah, me. So come on. And so he stepped out of that boat in faith. It shows us that people can start off right and begin to waver. And that's exactly what will happen. That you can start off full and strong of faith and knowing that God is the one that's upholding you. And then what happens is as soon as a little dust begins to kick up, you're ready to give up and go back out in the world. You see, that shows us where we are in the Lord. Those things come to show us where we are in the Lord. Hey, everybody can have faith as long as everything's going fine. I got I got a job. I'm paying all my bills. Hey, praise the Lord. God is good. I got all the faith in the world. It, it's easy to walk on on concrete. You see, you let that water, let that concrete turn into water. You see, you get to the point where you have to totally lean and, and trust in God. And we'll see how much faith you got. That's where it comes. You see, the Lord has shown me some things that was going to take place years ago. 
And I said, Lord, how in the world is all of that going to happen? And he said, you don't see a miracle until you need one. You don't see a miracle until you need one. Everybody that's got a testimony, you look at the root word of that, is test. And you don't get a testimony without a test. And, and that's the problem. Folks want to live on cloud nine all the time and don't want to go through anything, so their faith is never tried. But it's when you're going through something, that's where you know where you are with God, you see. <clears throat> so let's keep reading here. Verse 7 says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So it, it's not okay for us to, to waver in our faith or to have doubt, because that's all it takes is doubt. Just, just one little ounce of doubt. Peter had one little ounce of doubt, and the Bible says that he began to sink. Just one little ounce of doubt is all it takes. You see, think about it. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, when Eve, when when the devil came to Eve, what did he say? He he used that badge of doubt, what I call a badge of doubt, the word if. You see, it got, you're not going to surely die, for God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall that you'll be just like Him. You know, He got her to question God's word. So what, what caused the downfall of man? It wasn't the fact that she ate of that tree. It was the fact that she doubted God's word. And that's what opened up the door for everything else. Everybody understand? In, in, the, in the book of Romans, it tells us that all sin is unbelief. This world don't have a sin problem. They have an unbelief problem. Because sin begins with unbelief every single time. If you will trace it back and think about it, all sin begins with unbelief. Begins with that. He got Eve to disbelieve God's word. You see, he does that same thing today. Jesus Christ, <clears throat> he had just come off of that 40 day fast in the third chapter of Matthew and was baptized, or actually uh, was baptized in the third chapter of Matthew. And as he was being baptized, God spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then in the very next chapter, in chapter four, the devil came three times to him after that 40 day fast. And what did he say? If you believe, if you, if you be the son of God, do this. If you be the son of God, do that. What was he trying to do? Trying to get the Lord to doubt who he was. Why? Because if God can get you, if the, if the devil can get you to doubt who uh, who you are, like he was trying to get Jesus Christ to doubt who he was, then what's the use in going to the cross? If I'm not the son of God, the only one that's, that's really holy enough to, to go to the cross is one that haven't been born by sex. So if I'm not the son of God and Joseph did really sleep with Mary to, to, to bring me about, I'm not worthy to go to the cross. So the whole purpose of doubt is to keep you from obtaining and fulfilling God's will in your life. And let me make this clear. It only takes a little bit of doubt. You have to believe God wholeheartedly. There's no, no, there's no room for wavering whatsoever. You have to believe God's word above the circumstances. You see, uh, this brother who I uh, minister, who I've worked with over the years, you've heard me refer to him as uh, Brother Junior. Uh, he's, uh, let's see, Brother Junior is 83. 80, yeah, he's 83 years old now. Uh, said that he had went to the doctor one time and uh, they told him basically that he had a bad heart and it gave him six months to live. Now this was back in I think 86 or 87. And uh, he said so the doctor told him well we're gonna have to cut on you we're gonna have to you know go in and, and do all this work to your, your heart you know replace this valve and that one and do all of this. And uh, Brother Junior just looked at, his head, looked at him and said no I'm not gonna let you cut on me. I'm gonna just believe God for my healing. And so the doctor told him, well, you're going to die if we don't operate on you. And Brother Junior's response was, I'm going to die anyway, doctor. I'm going to leave here anyway. So, you know, you cutting on me is not going to prolong my life if I stay in God's will. And, of course, this has been almost 30 years ago, and he's still alive today, you see, because we walk by faith. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering, you see. That doubt will get us in trouble. 
You see, and this tells us verse seven for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, that ought to be a verse that ought to straighten us up. Mm -hmm. And don't yeah, we don't we can't think that we're going to receive anything of the Lord if, if, if we're doubting. Now, let me tell you what goes on in the spiritual realm. What's what takes place? <clears throat> uh, my predecessor, when he was praying for people that had cancer, the Lord would let him see in the spiritual realm. And he would be standing this way, talking to the person that was cancer, and he would tell the person who they, what their name was, what kind of cancer they, you know, that they, what, what the sickness was, what sickness was, you know, if they had cancer and things like that. And the reason why he would face this way instead of the audience was because he would see the spirit that was on the inside of this person. He, he said he would literally see it come up and... If, and now he would be preaching to a crowd of thousands of people. And so say, for instance, this person had breast cancer. Anybody out there in that audience that had it, that spirit of breast cancer that was in this person, it would rise up and conjure up uh, help from the people out there that had it. And it would try to cause doubt. You see why? Because all it needed was just to cause one little inch of doubt and that person wouldn't receive their healing. You see, and so when he would get finished pronouncing healing on this person, he would be able to look out in the audience and point out the people that had breast cancer or the same type of sickness because he would see the spirits of that was in those people raising up to basically join forces to cause doubt. Why? Because that spirit knew if I come out of this person, he's going to call me out everywhere. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see that? And so what would they do? They would try to bring doubt to the people. Try to bring doubt. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, there's a such thing as knowing that you know that you know that you know what God has said and what God has spoken to your life and in your life. And unfortunately, uh, the devil will use loved ones and will use people to try to bring doubt. Uh, you know, how are you going to make it? Uh, how are you going to do this? Uh, what's going to? No, I don't care. I don't know. All I know is what God told me to do, and that's what's going to happen. Now, God's got the rest of it figured out. I'm just going to be obedient to him. You see? But that doubt, if the devil can get you to doubt, oh, you know, I, I don't. My prayers is that people will wake up and that they will not become one of those people that when they get old, they're wondering, I wonder what would have happened if I had, obe if I had obeyed God years ago. I wonder where I would be today if I had just done what God had told me to do. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm just going to share this. And we'll, we might go into this a little later on as when God had me to preach on it. <clears throat> Some, uh, <clears throat> as you've heard me say before, uh, and I'll just tell you, just tell you this, this, about this, this dream. I had a dream several years ago, uh, back in, I want to say, 96 or 97, uh, about a young lady that I knew, uh, her parents was, were friends with my dad. And so uh, if, whenever I was talking to her, if her dad was over there, or her parents were over there, they would tell me different stories about my dad. Of course, my dad died when I was six years old. And so I didn't know a whole lot about him, even though him and my mother were married. You know, at six years old, you don't know much about your parents. You know, so most of what I found out, I found out through the stories of others. And so in 96 or 97, I want to say it was 96, it was, it was 96, I had a dream that this lady, her parents were HIV positive and uh, didn't think much about it. I woke up and thought it was a strange dream. And so uh, that following year, she called me uh, in August of, two th of 1997 and uh, she told me that her dad had been was going through sickness and that they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. You know, he was having fainting spells and things like that. And they took him to the hospital and, uh, you know, no, nobody could diagnose what was wrong. And finally, they took him to a big city, to a hospital there, and both her parents were diagnosed with HIV. And so, uh, said that a couple of months later, now this was in, in, in June, and in August, when she called me, he was dead. Now, this was a year after uh, the Lord had showed me that. But see, I didn't know. I doubted, you see. 
And so <clears throat> I contacted Brother Junior and asked him about it and asked him, why would the Lord show me something like that? And, and uh, you know, because I didn't get any instructions. I just saw that they were both HIV positive. Why would the Lord show me something like that and not tell me to do anything? And he spoke and said, the Lord is trying to get you to have confidence in what he show you. Because years later, <clears throat> you're going to have to walk in that. And so <clears throat> I gathered confidence from that. And so <clears throat> I called the lady back and uh, she told me that the, the insurance company, her mother was still alive. The insurance company was trying to drop her mother off of the insurance because they don't mind you uh, paying them insurance and as long as you're not sick, of course. But as soon as they got to start putting money back out, and, you know, they try to drop you then. And so they had dropped her and uh, they were wanting to sue the insurance company, you know, because they knew of her mother's condition. And so they didn't want to pay all of those bills. And so I told her, I said, you go ask your mother if she believes that God is a healer today. And so, and, and so she did. She said, yes, she believed that. I said, well, you tell her that if she'll believe it, if she'll go to the hospital on, on my word and what I'm telling her and, and, and have that test ran again, if she'll do that, then it'll come back negative. She'll never have to worry about HIV again. And that, that's what happened. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a call <clears throat> that her mother had went to the hospital, uh, to the doctor, and they ran the test, and they didn't find it. And as far as I know, her mother is still living, you see. And so if the devil, if the devil can bring doubt, then he's got you. Now, I'm going to tell you how this, thank you, Joshua. I'm going to tell you how this happened, how this ended up biting me, you know, later on. Later on, uh, I had a dream that my, my brother, the one I'm telling you about, uh, we're not biological brothers, we're cousins by blood. Uh, but he was raised with us, and so we just called him our brother. He had a, his, his father's uh, grandparents uh, lived right around the corner from our maternal grandparents. And so when we would go visit our grandparents, I would go with him to visit his dad's, you know, parents. And so uh, I was like a grandchild of them as well, you see. And so uh, I had a dream. Now, it had been years since I had seen them. And I had a dream that I went into this house and there was his grandmother. And she said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm doing well. She, I said, how are you? And she said, I'm doing okay. I said, how is your husband? And she said, oh, he's, he's not doing too well. She said, but I tell you what, he will, he will live if you'll go pray for him. And so that was the end of that dream. I woke up and I didn't think too much about it. I'm going to tell you why. Because years earlier, uh, an auntie of mine had told me that the man had died. I asked how he was doing. She said, oh, he's, he's, already, he's deceased already. And so about 10 days later, I talked to my sister after this dream where his grandmother was saying, if you go pray for my husband, he'll live. About 10 days later, I, go, uh, I was talking to my sister on the phone, and I asked him, where's my, our brother at? She said, oh, he's in Mississippi burying his grandfather. You see? And so what happened was, I believed the word of a relative over what the Lord had showed me in a dream. Amen. See, and so since I doubted what I saw, it, what good did it do me for the Lord to show me that? You see? And that's the way it is. If, if the devil can get you to doubt, that's why I tell people, don't ever throw away a dream. Don't ever throw away something. Because, listen... If the Lord taking his time to show you something, there's a reason for it. He ain't doing it because he's bored and he won't entertain you because you don't watch much television. So I'm going to just put a TV set in your head. When you go to sleep, you're just going to have all kind of lovely experience. No, when the Lord shows you something, that it's for a reason, you see. And so I, I doubted that. Well, I, I mean, think about it. Somebody tell you somebody deceased, you're not expecting them to see them later on in life. Not on this side. And so I believed what my aunt said. Well, he's already gone. He's already deceased. You see? And so I, I learned from that experience not to doubt. Not to doubt. And so why? Because when we doubt, we don't, we don't get to walk in the blessings. And we don't get to experience and see those things that God wants us to see and experience. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. 
All right.